all right uh, good morning this is second lecture of the physical biology module and let's start by reviewing what we did in the first lecture in the first lecture we looked at the protein molecules and the forces that can act on a small protein molecule so what i started with was that let's consider a small protein whose size is 3 nanometer and weight is 100 kilo dalton this was going to be my favorite protein and we estimated the magnitude of different kind of forces that can act on a protein molecule right and when we looked at the magnitude of different kind of forces that can act on a protein molecule what we found that when we are whenever we are talking about the protein uh, the ma the force acting on a small protein molecule of this size the dominant forces are going to be which forces thermal forces and viscous forces these are the only two dominant forces and the inertial forces which are very dominant in the macroscopic world these inertial forces are almost negligible right and therefore you can ignore the effect of the gravity However, in spite of that, what I told you that we can still use a combination of three mechanical elements, mass, then spring and a dash pot to model a number of biological systems and phenomena, right. So, we looked at two examples, one of them was a combination of a dash pot and a mass. And this is used for modeling what kind of system? We use this model for modeling what kind of system? For modeling the motion of the objects which are submerged in the fluid, right? And similarly, we can use a parallel combination of a dash pot and a spring to model the shape deformation of the objects submerged in the liquid right and after this we looked at I gave you an estimate of how much time this small protein will take to sediment let us say by a distance of 1 centimeter and this time was something like 38.05 years right and towards the end of the lecture we use this model to calculate the stopping distance for a bacteria as well as for a small puffer phase. So, what we consider was that suppose there is a bacteria of size 1 micron and let us say by using the flagellum it was initially traveling with a speed of 10 microns per second. We tried to calculate its stopping distance and then the other example we took was in the macroscopic world. So, we had a 1 millimeter size puffer face which was traveling at a speed of 10 millimeters per second and we also calculated the stopping distance of this puffer phase when its fins stop working right. What we found in the first case that the stopping distance for the puffer phase was something like 2.8 millimeters. So, which means that object in the microscopic world even if the propulsive force will is gone will cover a distance which will be few times of its body length before stopping. On the other hand if you look at a microscopic object like a bacteria as soon as the propulsive force is gone it will stop in instantaneously for all practical purposes and we calculated the stopping distance for the bacteria to be 0.028 angstrom which is less than the size of a single water molecule. So, what this problem tells me that when we are in the microscopic world the microscopic organisms cannot take the advantage of the inertia. On the other hand, the objects will leave, which live in the macroscopic world which are bigger in size, they can take the advantage of the inertia and even if the propelling force is gone, they can move for certain distance, right. So, I told you that we can use a combination of these three mechanical elements to model a number of biological systems and phenomena. And it turns out there is a 
complete analogy with this mechanical system of mass spring and dash part with a electrical system of resistance capacitance and inductor okay let's see how so in the mechanical system my elements are mass then spring and a dash part the other variables are i can apply a force on the mechanical system this will lead to certain velocity and there will be certain displacement right similarly in a electrical system what i have resistance then inductor a capacitance and the driving force for a electrical system is the voltage there will be current and current flows because of the charge right so here we can clearly see that equivalent of the force will be the voltage equivalent of the velocity will be current equivalent of the displacement will be the charge right now let's see what is the analogy because this analogy is sometimes useful for solving the numerical problems suppose you cannot think of a solution what will be the solution in the mechanical world what you can try to do you can try to translate the problem into the electrical world get its solution and translate it back to the mechanical world okay so what is the equivalent of a spring in the electrical system which one out of these three capacitor because when you apply a voltage capacitor charges and discharges similarly this one extends and contracts right so for this one the equivalent will be this okay for a dash part what is the equivalent of a dash part what is the equivalent of a dash part inductor or resistance resistance because in a mechanical system this is the dissipative element and in an electrical system the resistance is the dissipative element and then for the third one i am not left with any choice the equivalent of this will be a inductor right that is the correct answer but why why the equivalent of a mass will be the inductor inductance why what is what is the argument what is the property of the mass okay so the mass has a inertia so it will try to oppose its change of state and the inductor also has the same property right it will try to oppose the growth of the current or decay of the current through it okay so this one is equivalent to this one all right and you can use this analogy to solve the numerical problems all right now let's come back to something which i discussed few minutes back that if you look at the sedimentation time of a small protein of 100 kilo dalton size and 3 nanometer in size 100 kilo dalton in uh, mass and 3 nanometer in size then the total time required will be something like 38.05 years right and one cannot wait for this much time to do a single experiment right you want your proteins or biomolecules to sediment faster and for that purpose people use something called ultra centrifuges okay for example in our department we have one ultra centrifuge now the these ultra centrifuges if you look at the cost of them they are not many of them are not manufactured in india and most of them are imported and the property of these ultra centrifuges is that they can run with a speed of 100000 rpm and by using by running at that rpm they can produce a effective gravitational force which is 800000 times that of the normal gravitational force okay and if you use that kind of force on a particle then you can make them to sediment faster maybe probably within hours or within a day or two depending on the size of the biomolecule right the smaller is the biomolecule more time it will take okay so people use 
centrifuges in the lab. So, we have one in the department, right? And just because biomolecules take a lot of time to sediment because of their tiny mass, biologists use the centrifuges in their lab. Now, the problem is that we are in IIT, we are in good institute, we have infrastructure, so we can buy these expensive ultra centrifuges, okay. But there are many places in the country around the world where they do not have this kind of infrastructure to buy the centrifuges and they do not have, even if you have them, you have bought them, sometimes there is no 24 hour electricity, how will you run them, right. And therefore, there is always a need for the frugal solutions. So, one of the frugal solutions to solve this problem was proposed by one of the faculty member at Stanford, his name is Manu Prakash and he was a alumnus of IIT Kanpur. So, I, let me just tell you about this, what he has proposed or developed is called a paper fuse. Let us look at this video. From a technical spec point of view, we can match centrifuges that cost all the way from $1,000 to $5,000. But this is a tool that requires no electricity, no infrastructure. You can carry them around in your pockets for a price point of 20 cents. We call it a paper fuge. It's essentially a piece of paper and we put in uh, small holders for capillaries that we can fill with blood. And we have standard string and we take two pieces of either PVC pipe or wooden handles and then you just pull on it gently. As you spin, the disc is uh, rotating back and forth. It's rotating in an oscillatory fashion. And there's a moment when the disc is stationary, and then it starts to unwind and go in the other direction as you apply a force. With this set of principles, we're able to essentially make a centrifuge that spins all the way to 120,000 RPM and 30,000 G-forces. In the lab, we can separate and pull out malaria parasites from blood. We can separate uh, filaria, African sleeping sickness, separate blood plasma. It is an ultra low cost centrifuge that's built out of principles of a very old toy, the whirly gig. This is a toy that I used to play with as a kid. The puzzle was that I didn't know how fast this would spin. And so I got intrigued and I set this up on a high speed camera. And uh, I couldn't believe my eyes. This thing, when you hear the noise, is actually going at 10 to 15,000 RPM. To me, that seemed like what we wanted to actually make a centrifuge. Before us, nobody had actually understood how this toy works. So we spent a significant portion of this time truly understanding the mathematical phase space for how you can convert linear motion into rotational motion. And there's some beautiful mathematics hidden inside this object. There is a value in this whimsical nature of searching for solutions because it really forces us outside our own sets of constraints of what a product should actually look like. The centrifuge is the workhorse of any laboratory from diagnostics to biology. And if you build a very essential, a key instrument, then you open up to a whole different variety of applications. We just got back from Madagascar. We took the tool uh, out to the field to work with health workers and we're starting a clinical validation trial on a larger scale to share it with the community and the healthcare service providers, get the feedback. So it's a very iterative cycle. There is of the order of a billion people around the world that live with absolutely no infrastructure, no roads, no electricity. So for us, the inspiration is to make the simplest possible tools that do the job well, such that you can get them distributed around the world. All right, so I will stop here. So what we have done so far, we have looked at the forces when you go to the microscopic scale, right? What we know that when we are at the macroscopic scale, inertial forces matter a lot. But the moment you go to the microscopic scale, inertial forces are negligible when you are in the cellular and molecular world and the dominant forces are viscous and thermal forces, okay. Now what we will do in this lecture, we will try to understand the effect of the surrounding medium on the functioning of a biological system, right. The reason is that if you look at most of the biomolecules, most of the biomolecules require a fluid medium to function, right. If there is no fluid medium, they cannot function and many microorganisms also require fluid medium for their survival. And therefore, we would like to understand how the surrounding medium affects the functioning of a biological system, especially at the 
microscopic scale. All right. So let's look at some experiments before we talk about it. Now many many of you have might have done this at home. Suppose you take water in a beaker or in a vessel, okay, and then you put a stirrer, and using that stirrer you try to stir the water slowly. No matter how slowly you are stirring the water, it will develop the ripple, right? On the other hand, you fill your container with the honey and you again try to stir it, right? So for a slow speed of stirring, let us say with the same speed with which you are stirring the water, it will not develop the ripples, right? Easily. Now what I am going to show you is an experiment and what is there in this experiment is following. In this experiment there are two concentric cylinders, one of them is like this, the other one is like this okay, and then there is a handle attached. Okay. Now this gap between these two, so this is like let us say a solid one. Now this gap is filled with something called corn syrup. Okay. When I will start the video, you see that somebody will bring a dropper and he will put 3 drops of ink, 3 different drops of ink at 3 different positions and then he will start stirring in one direction. After stirring it for a while, he will stop it and then he will stir it in the opposite direction. Okay. So, let us look at this experiment with the corn starch okay, and see what is, what, what is happening. So, this is the dropper and with the dropper he is putting 3 do drops of the ink, yellow one, then this is probably the blue one. red one and then he will start slowly rotating the handle. Now as he is rotating the handle you will see that the color is spreading right and as he rotates more and more it will spread further and further. So this is in the clockwise direction. Now he will stop and he will start rotating it in the opposite direction and in clockwise and see what is happening now. Alright, what you see here that all the colors are almost coming back to their original position okay? and you can also do this experiment at home. You take the Wim liquid and take the food color, you can actually do this experiment with even the Wim liquid. Okay? So, what, and if you do the similar experiment with the water, do you think the colors will come back to their original position? No, right? Why this happening? Because in this case, we have a highly viscous medium, very thick medium okay? and the flow of the liquid is laminar. That means the successive layers of the liquids are not intermixing okay? when you are applying a shear force. So, in this case the flow is laminar. On the other hand, if you do this experiment with a thin liquid like water which we perceive as thin liquid, okay? then what do you expect that the fluid flow will become? turbulent okay, and there will be intermixing of the successive layers of the fluid. Right? What we know that whenever the fluid flow is laminar, then in that case the motion is, dom uh, motion is dominated by the viscosity of the medium and in this case the viscous forces are dominant. On the other hand, in case of a turbulent flow, the motion is dominated by the inertial forces. 
Okay. Now, let's come back to what we did in the last lecture. What we found in the last lecture that if I have a microscopic object like a bacteria, even if it was moving with a very fast speed, okay, as soon as the propeller stops, it stops within a distance of 0 0.028 angstrom. On the other hand, if you have bigger object like a fish or a puffer fish, then it will take a while to stop, right. Similarly, if we are swimming in the water in the microscopic world, if we make few strokes, if we stop making strokes, we will also go to a certain distance before we stop, right. So, that is the difference which you see between the swimming in the microscopic world and macroscopic world. What is happening in the microscopic world as soon as the propulsive force is gone, the objects stop instantaneously for all practical purposes, but in the microscopic world objects do take some time, do travel some distance before they stop, right. Now, suppose I am swimming in the swimming pool and I have to stop instantaneously as soon as I stop making strokes, okay. You will appreciate that in that case I will have to perform my motion not in a fluid like water, but in a fluid which is more, much more viscous than water, right. Only then as soon as I stop making the strokes I will stop, right. So, in order for me to stop, I need to perform this motion in a medium which is much more viscous than water, probably honey, right, or very concentrated sugar solution, right. Only then I will stop instantaneously as soon as I stop making strokes, right. So, if you look at the medium, the medium is same, right. In this case, medium is water, even in this case, medium is water, right. So, what is common here in these two pictures, it is the same medium in which the objects are swimming. But if I have to stop instantaneously as soon as I stop making stroke, I need to perform my motion in a fluid which is much more viscous than water. That means, this bacteria is also perceiving this medium water as a very, very thick medium. That is why it is, it is stopping as soon as the propulsive force is gone, right. So, that means, the same medium can behave differently depending on the length scale. For us, we perceive the water as a very thin medium, right. We can swim very nicely into it, okay. And even if we stop making stroke, we go for a certain distance. But the same medium water behaves like a very, very thick medium for a microscopic organism like bacteria and therefore, as soon as it stops, it stops moving the flagellum, it stops immediately, right. What this tells you that the same medium can behave differently at different length scales, okay. For a bacterium, water is like a medium which is much more viscous than probably honey, but the same medium we perceive as a very, very thin medium. So, what I mean to say? that the same medium water can behave differently depending on at what length scale we are, okay. For a microscopic organism, the same medium water behaves like a very, very thick medium and for us the water, we perceive the water as a very, very thin medium. Now, this brings me to a problem. Since the same medium can behave like a very thin medium or a very thick medium, how do I say under what conditions a given medium will behave like a very thick medium or a very viscous medium and under what conditions a given medium will behave like a thin medium or less viscous medium. Is this clear? The reason is that the same medium water behaves like a very, very thick medium and for us the same medium water behaves like a very thin medium. So, how do I say under what conditions a given medium will behave like a thin medium or thick medium, right. So, how do we differentiate between a thin medium and thick medium or how do I distinguish and whenever the medium will behave like a thick medium, the fluid flow will be laminar, right. And whenever the medium behaves like a 
thin medium the fluid flow will be turbulent. So, under what conditions the fluid flow will be laminar and under what condition the fluid flow will be turbulent or under what conditions the fluid flow will be dominated by the viscosity of the medium and under what condition the fluid flow will be dominated by the inertia of the moving object right because the same medium can behave differently. So, how do I distinguish between a thin medium and thick medium? How do I distinguish between a laminar flow and turbulent flow? Under what conditions a given medium will show a turbulent flow or a laminar flow or under what conditions the fluid flow will be dominated by the inertia of the moving object or the viscosity of the surrounding fluid right. So, this, this is the problem which I have because a medium can behave differently depending on the length scale right. And if I have medium, then a medium is characterized by two properties, one of them is called viscosity of the medium and the density of the medium, right. Now, you can see that I know the viscosity of the water and I also, I also know the density of the water, but by knowing the viscosity and density of the wa water, I cannot make a comment on whether the water will behave like a thick medium or thin medium because it can behave differently depending on the length scale ok. Now, in order to solve this problem people have come up with an alternative description to distinguish between a thick medium and thin medium or the regimes of laminar flow and turbulent flow or between the regimes of when the motion will be dominated by inertia and when the motion will be dominated by viscous forces and that prescription is called viscous critical force. So, remember that I have two properties of the liquid or of the fluid which are known to me. Now, using these two quantities I can construct a quantity which is called F critical which is defined as eta square upon rho. So, using the properties of the medium eta and rho I can construct a quantity which is called F critical. If you do a dimensional analysis you will find that the dimension of this quantity will be the that of the force ok. And now using this how do I distinguish between a thin fluid and thick fluid or between the laminar flow and turbulent flow? It is done in the following way. Suppose I have an object which is moving in a fluid of given viscosity and density. So, suppose I have an object which is moving in a fluid of given viscosity and density by let us say applying a force of F ok. Now, if F is less than F critical then I will say that medium will behave like a thick medium the fluid flow will be laminar and the motion will be dominated by the viscosity of the medium. On the other hand, if F is greater than F critical, then medium will behave like a thin medium, the fluid flow will be turbulent and motion will be dominated by the inertia. So, by using this alternative description, I can distinguish between a thin fluid and thick fluid and this people had to invent this alternative description because the same medium can behave like a thick fluid and thin fluid all right. Now, you can see that for a given fluid eta and rho are fixed and therefore, each medium will have a unique F critical right. Now, what I want you to do that can you please calculate the value of F critical for water assuming that its density is 1000 kilogram per meter cube and viscosity is 1 milli Pascal second. Please do this. Please calculate the value of F critical for water. How about you? All right. What is the unit? Huh? Okay. Unit? 
unit, unit. You got that? Okay. So I, what I told you just now that if I know the viscosity of the medium and density of the medium, we can calculate the viscous critical force for a given medium, right? And for water, it comes out to be how much? One nano newton. This comes out to be ten to the power minus nine newton. Are one nano newton, okay, for water. Now let's also look at the value of F critical for some other mediums, okay. So this is what is shown here. That sometimes people also consider the air as a fluid medium, and if you look at the value of F critical for air, it is something like four into ten to the power minus ten. For water, it is eight into ten to the power minus ten because we used one milli pascal second. Uh, we used one milli pascal second, so then it becomes ten into ten to the power minus ten, one nano newton, right? This is approximately one nano newton. For olive oil, which we perceive as slightly thicker medium, the value of F critical is slightly higher. If you go to glycerine, right, it is even higher. If you go to corn syrup, it is something like zero point zero three newtons, right? So, what we find here that if the F critical for water is 1 nano Newton, right? And water is one of the mediums which is abundantly found in the biological systems, right? And if you go to the molecular and cellular scales, the forces which are exerted, they are of the order of what? They are of the order of pico Newton, right? So, if you go to the cellular and molecular world, the forces are of the order of pico Newton. Which one is smaller? This one is smaller or this one is smaller? Pico Newton is much, much smaller. That means in the microscopic world, right? In the microscopic world, all the time we are in this regime. F is less than F critical and therefore, for all practical purposes water behaves like a very thick medium. The fluid flow is laminar and the motion is always dominated by the viscosity of the medium, right. On the other hand, recall the example of studying with a glass rod. No matter how slow you are doing it, you are always applying a force which is much, much greater than 1 nano Newton and therefore, for all practical purposes the fluid flow remains turbulent, right. So, as long as we are in the microscopic world, the value of F remains below the F critical and therefore, water behaves like a thick medium, the fluid flow is laminar and the motion is dominated by viscosity of the medium and this is what is written here. That says the typical scale of forces inside the cells is pico Newton, viscous forces rule the inner world of the cells, okay. So, now I have two different kinds of world, okay. Microscopic world, in the microscopic world it is the viscous forces which rule, okay. On the other hand in the macroscopic world they are the inertial forces which are dominant, alright. Now, this is one of the ways to distinguish between a thin fluid and thick fluid or the regimes of laminar flow and turbulent flow. Okay, or the regimes of when the motion will be dominated by viscosity and when the motion will be dominated by inertia. But there is also a, an alternative way to distinguish between the regimes of laminar flow and turbulent flow and that is based on something called Reynolds number. Okay. Now, my question is all of you have heard about the Reynolds number. If somebody asks you a question, what is the Reynolds number? What is your answer? It is given by this formula. No. What is Reynolds number? If somebody asks you a question that what is Reynolds number, what is going to be a crisp answer of two lines? First thing you have to say that Reynolds number is a dimensionless number. Okay. 
So, first thing you have to say that Reynolds number is a dimensionless number and the the second thing second thing that you have to say that Reynolds number is a dimensionless number because it is a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces acting on an object. Okay, this is why it is a dimensionless number. So, Reynolds number is a number which is a ratio of two forces inertial forces and viscous forces. Okay. Now, you can see from here that in the macroscopic world inertial forces are large and viscous forces are small and therefore, in the macroscopic world you expect the Reynolds number to be much much greater than 1 or very large. On the other hand, if you go to the microscopic world, then in that case inertial forces are negligible and viscous forces are large and therefore, you expect the Reynolds number to be very very small. Okay? All right. And Reynolds number is given by this formula, which is rho R V upon eta. Now, if you open different textbooks, you will also find sometimes different formula. Sometimes instead of rho, there will be d, sometimes there will be l. So, I do not worry about all of that. All you have to remember this is the this r has to be the characteristic length of the object in the direction of the flow. All right. Now, if you ever forget this formula, there is a very quick way of deriving it and that is following. Suppose, you have a ball of water of radius r which moves with velocity v from here to here just to the adjacent position. right? What you can calculate? How much time will be required? Time will be given by how much distance it has traveled divided by velocity. And when this goes from here to here, the same amount of water will move from here to here and therefore, you can estimate the mean acceleration of the water which will be half a t square and using that you can calculate the acceleration and we can also can calculate the inertial force which is mass into acceleration. Similarly, the viscous forces which will act will be, be given by Stokes law 6 pi eta r v. Okay. So, what I am doing I am tossing all the p factors I am just taking the ratio of these two. Okay. And if you take the ratio of these two inertial forces versus viscous forces, you get this formula. right? So, what I told you so far that if we are in the macroscopic world, Reynolds number is very high and if we are in the microscopic world, Reynolds number is very low or alternatively we can also say that if Reynolds number is very, very small, we can ignore the inertial forces okay? because viscous forces are dominant in those cases. So, this is an exercise for you. Please calculate the Reynolds number for a 10 centimeter puffer face which is swimming in water at a speed of 100 centimeters per second which is a microscopic object and then calculate the Reynolds number for a microscopic object like a bacterium which is swimming in water at a speed of 10 microns per second. Please do it quickly. And suppose this is R okay, or D whichever you want to choose. What is the answer for the first one? 10 to the power 5. What is the answer for the second one? 10 to the power minus 5. You can see that this is right. So, in the microscopic world, Reynolds number is very small and in the microscopic world Reynolds number is very large. Okay? So, what I can say that we live in a high Reynolds number world and microscopic objects and microscopic organisms live in a low Reynolds number world. So, our world is a high Reynolds number world and the world in which bacteria lives, biomolecules functions that world is a low Reynolds number world. All right?
So, this is what is written here that microorganisms live in the world of low Reynolds number where viscous forces rule their motion and this is the calculation you can see all right. Now, so the world we in which we are living in and the world in which the microorganisms are living on living in are completely different ok. They live in a world of low Reynolds number and we live in a world of high Reynolds number ok. And one of the very interesting article on this subject was written by this gentleman E M Purcell. He was a Nobel laureate, but he did not get a Nobel prize for writing this paper ok. But this is one of his highly cited work. Okay. And if you look at this paper, this paper was published around 1976 okay. and he received a Nobel prize for something else which is called nuclear magnetic resonance in 1952 okay. Now this is the citation of the paper. Now if you are interested in the life of the micro, micro organisms at low Reynolds number you should definitely read this article, you will not be able to understand everything, but you will understand few things ok. Now what I will do in this lecture, I will not describe the entire paper, result from the entire paper, what I will do, I will just describe a small result from this paper ok. So let us look at what is written here, what is written here that most microorganisms live in the fluid environments where they experience a viscous force that is many orders of magnitude is stronger than inertial force which means they live in low Reynolds number environment and a consequence of this is something called a scallop theorem. Now what is scallop theorem let us try to understand. How many of you have heard of this word scallop before? No, none of you ok. So let me show you what, how does a scallop look like. So this is how the scallop look like ok and they are normally found on the seashore or maybe by the side of the pond right. Now let us see a real scallop, this is called a queen scallop and how it swims. Somebody disturb it, it opens up water centers and then it closes itself and the water gets out from the back side and it moves in the forward direction ok, like a rocket because of the thrust alright. Now let us go back to scallop theorem. So, what does the scallop theorem state? What it says that if a low Reynolds number swimmer that means any swimmer in the microscopic world executes geometrically reciprocal motion. What is the meaning of a geometrically reciprocal motion? It is defined here that is a sequence of shape changes that are identical when reversed ok. Now, if you look at the motion of the scallop how, how, how what it is doing? It is opening up its cell like this closing it ok. Now, this kind of motion is called geometrically reciprocal motion why because it is taking, taking the same path while in the forward direction and backward direction or forward stroke and backward stroke forward right forward stroke or reverse stroke. So, this kind of motion is called geometrically reciprocal motion. If I am standing here I can do this kind of motion right this kind of motion is again geometrically reciprocal motion because my hands are taking the same path in the forward and backward stroke right. But I can also start from here and I can come back to this position how but not by doing this but by doing some other kind of motion I can also do it like this. This motion is not the geometrically reciprocal motion because I am not taking the same path while coming back right clear. So, a scallop is performing a geometrically reciprocal motion. Now, what does it say that If a low, low Reynolds number swimmer executes a geometrically reciprocal motion that is a sequence of shape changes that are identical when reversed ok. So, any, any kind of flappy motion opening or closing ok going up and down by the same path then the net displacement of the swimmer must be 0. What it means that suppose you have seen a scallop how it is swimming right and being an engineer you think that ok a scallop can swim like this you try to design a microscopic swimmer. What the scallop theorem tells you that if you are designing a microscopic swimmer which is doing this kind of motion then the net displacement of the swimmer must be 0 if the fluid is incompressible and Newtonian that means 
if the motion is happening in a medium which is incompressible and Newtonian. What is the meaning of incompressible medium? Medium, medium which cannot be compressed. So, water for all practical purposes you can assume that it is an incompressible medium and it is a Newtonian fluid. What is a Newtonian fluid? You keep the water between two plates and you apply a shear force it does not change the viscosity. So, any fluid which does not change the viscosity by applying a shear force is called a Newtonian fluid. So, for all practical purposes the water can be considered as a incompressible and Newtonian fluid. So, what is scallop theorem tells you that by, a, by uh, being an engineer you have seen a macroscopic scallop in your daily life which swims like this and you think that I will do a simply scale down I will design a microscopic scallop and it will also do this motion and it will swim in the water it will not swim engineering will fail because of the scallop theorem. You cannot make the machines by just doing a simple scale down ok. So, we are not going to prove this. So, I told you that there are two kinds of fluid one of the fluids is called Newtonian fluid the other kind of fluids is are called non Newtonian fluid. Newtonian fluids are ones which do not change the viscosity when you apply a shear force, but there are also other kinds of fluid which are called non Newtonian fluids and I have examples of two different kinds of fluids here. One of them is called a both of them are non Newtonian fluid one of them is called shear thickening fluid the other one is called shear thinning fluid I will talk about them after a while ok. So, scallop theorem is clear now let us look at something else. Now, this is your another tutorial problem what is given to you in this problem is following that suppose there is a bacteria in a pond and bacteria has two hands like this ok. Now, many of you know who uh, many many of you who know the swimming you know that you can go up and down in the water right. If you go into the water if you beat your hands very fast you, you will go upward right and if you bring it back slowly you will go downward by a, a small amount and uh, as a result if you if this motion is very fast this motion is very slow you will have a net upward displacement. Suppose a bacteria has seen you doing like doing this kind of thing up and down motion ok. Now, this bacteria in the pond also tries to do the same thing what it does that I, I also have two hands like human beings. So, I will beat my hands very fast like this I will go upward by a large amount and when I bring it back slowly I will go downward by a small amount and as a result I will have a net displacement. Unfortunately, what this bacteria finds that the net displacement will be equal to 0 why because of the scallop theorem. It is performing a geometrically reciprocal motion it is a micron size object it is a low Reynolds number swimmer and therefore, the net displacement has to be 0 as long as the motion is like this right. Now, this is one of the tutorial problems which you will which will solve right. So, what I told you so far that if I have a low Reynolds number swimmer Then, if it is performing a reciprocal motion, in a or let me let me say geometrically reciprocal motion, in a Newtonian fluid, so if I have a low Reynolds number swimmer or a microscopic object, and if it is performing a geometrically reciprocal motion in Newtonian fluid like water the net displacement will be 0 right. But we do know that many microscopic organisms do swim in water right. So, how do, do they do it how they avoid this problem there is something which is done by using something called non geometrically reciprocal motion ok. So, if you look at the bacteria bacteria has a flagellum at the end right and there is a rotary motor. So, what bacteria does it rotates with a very very high speed and as a result it performs the flagellum makes a helical shape. Now, any circular motion or a helical motion is not a geometrically reciprocal motion. So, that is how the bacteria which have flagellum avoid this problem. Now, many of the my microscopic organisms also have cilia right.
Now, if you look at the motion of the cilia, what it does? Cilia beats like this, and then it has to come back. It doesn't come back like this. It beats like this. It comes back like this. Beats like this. Comes back like this. And this is how they avoid this problem of geometrically reciprocal motion in the Newtonian fluid, right? So this is one of the strategies to solve this problem, right? Which has been which has been designed by the nature, right? Now, what is the other alternative? Now, being an engineer, you can appreciate that if you want to design something which can move, right? The, these kind of motions are the simplest ones to perform, right? Simplest ones to opening and closing, right? Moving up and down are the e easier ones to perform. And therefore, suppose you have to design an artificial swimmer, right? then you need to perform this motion. That means, you have to replace the fluid by a non-Newtonian fluid. That means, a fluid which changes the viscosity when you apply a shear force. So, there are two kinds of fluid, Newtonian fluid like water which do not change the viscosity when you apply a shear force and there are also fluids which are called non-Newtonian fluids which change the viscosity when you apply a shear force. Now, this is what you what I have here are two different kinds of fluid, non-Newtonian fluids. One of them is called shear thickening fluid and this is called a shear thinning fluid. Okay. Now, let us look at first the shear thickening fluid. Okay. Now, this is called a shear thickening fluid. So, what I have here is a thick mixture of corn starch and water okay. and this is something which you can also do at home. Now, what you see here? that I can lift it like this. When I am dealing with this fluid very gently, I can lift it like a curd, right? fine. But when I try to do this, I can put my spoon all the way inside, right? it is bouncing back. Let me mix it for second first. Now, look at this. If I am trying to do this, I cannot put the spoon inside, right? On the other on the other hand, if I am trying to put this gently, I can put it inside all the way inside, right? Again, look at this. When I am trying to do something like this, I cannot put, put it inside. So, this kind of material is called a shear thickening material. Okay. In fact, if I bring a gun and I shoot a bullet into it, it will reflect the bullet back. Okay. So, this is the property of a shear thickening fluid. All right. Now, let us look at let us look, look at this video and I will talk about this video. not water this is the same thing a mixture of water and cornstarch So, this was an example of a shear thickening fluid. Okay, good. All right. Now, what you saw that when people were, try, were trying to walk out, walk on it very slowly, they were actually sinking. But if people were jumping on it, playing on it, right, 
it was behaving as if it was like a solid material right now these kind of materials are also called viscoelastic material okay why they are called viscoelastic material because they have the property of both viscosity as well as elasticity right so viscosity is the property of a liquid or solid viscosity is the property of a liquid and elasticity is a property of a solid and a material which can act as both solid as well as liquid is called a viscoelastic material so this is one of the examples of a viscoelastic material it turns out that many body fluids also behave like viscoelastic material so this was an example of a shear thickening material on the other hand i have another example and this is something which you also use in your food very often okay you don't realize that okay now many of the sauce and ketchups nowadays have this additive which is called jantham gum right if you have a sauce if the sauce is like this when you are putting it in the plate it is a good sauce right if it stays like this and if you put the sauce and if it spreads into the entire plate like water it's not a good sauce right and therefore you want a material which can stay solid but when you try you are trying to pour it it should flow like a liquid right now these kind of materials are called shear thinning material that under shear force they become thinner they flow like liquid okay so this is a example of a shear thinning fluid let me do something else with this so that you can appreciate this okay so this is water and i have a needle here so i have a needle now just i am doing this thing what with water just to show you how small the opening is okay what is inside now try to look at the size of the opening it's a very small opening right and if you have material like this many many of you will have the feeling that i cannot fill up the syringe with this i will have a lot of difficulty in pouring this material or putting this material inside the syringe okay but let's look at that if i can do that very easily i have filled up the syringe up to this point right in general you have feeling that if i have material like this it will be very hard to put in see the, how small the opening was now i have this material filled up to here right without any difficulty right and if you have material like this this kind of thick material from your daily life experience sometimes you feel that if i try to push this liquid out i will have a lot of difficulty right but look at this okay so i'm holding the syringe like this okay my hands are like this fine my hands are empty right okay good all right now let, let's look at this right it is staying like this so now it has become solid but when uh, when i applied a lot of shear force it got converted into a liquid like material it flowed very easily and then it got stuck here okay so this is an example of a shear thinning material all right all right now coming back to the science what i told you that if there is a low reynolds number swimmer if it is performing a geometrically reciprocal motion in newtonian fluid the displacement must be zero and many natural microorganisms do not perform a geometrically reciprocal motion in newtonian fluid like water okay but if you have to design artificial swimmer which performs geometrically reciprocal motion then you need to replace the fluid by a non newtonian fluid right so this is something which was known from the time of em purcell right from year 1976 and after how many years 2014 so this paper was published in 2014 after how many years you can calculate right after a large number of years so it took so many years of technological advancement to prove that it is possible to make the microscopic objects to swim by the geometrical reciprocal motion but by replacing the fluid by a 
non-Newtonian force. So, I am going to play this video. Please look at this video. So in our research group, we want to build micro machines and uh, micro robots that can swim in solution. And um, that is difficult because at small length scales, there are no motors or parts that we can just buy. Therefore, whatever we build has to be really simple. And the uh, simplest possible scheme that we can think of is just simply something that expands and contracts, or maybe something that flaps, opens and closes, like in a, in a clam. Um, but the difficulty is that if one builds something that's really small, then this kind of flapping motion doesn't work because at small length scales, swimming is really different from the kind of swimming that we're used to. And the physics tells us that simple opening and closing doesn't work. And this is known and it's been known for more than 30 years as the scallop theorem is due to Purcell. And uh, the scallop theorem uh, teaches us that uh, these kind of flapping motions uh, do not apply in water. But the interesting thing is that not all liquids are like water, and that is really where our research comes in. Here, this is a beaker of hyaluronic acid. This is a shear thinning fluid. And when I move the spoon slowly in the fluid, it will be higher resistance. But if I move really fast the, the spoon in the beaker, it will be lower resistance, so low viscosity at higher speed. Here is the micro swimmer that we built in the shape of a scallop. Uh, the width of the scallop is 300 micron. We made this by 3D printing and then micro-molding technique. We can control the opening and closing of the scallop by, by using an external magnetic field. And we can also control the speed of opening and closing of the two shells. Because of the scallop theorem, this micro-robot does not move in water. However, there are fluids other than water that have different properties, so-called non-Newtonian fluids. And they include most fluids one finds in the human body and tissues, such as blood, the vitreous in the eye, and the fluids of the joints. This is a rheometer. We use this machine to measure the fluid viscosity. We put the fluid in between two moving plates and by moving the plates, we measure the speed and its torque. Uh, by calculating this, we can know the viscosity of different fluids. So we've heard about how fluids can have different viscosities, and Newtonian fluids have constant viscosities, whereas non-Newtonian fluids can have viscosities that change depending on the shear rate or the speed with which the object moves through them. So instead of using the rheometer to change the fluid properties, we're going to instead use the scallop itself to change the viscosity of the fluid in the area around it. It's best to think of the scallop stroke as being divided into two phases. You have a rapid closing phase and a slow opening phase. And because the shells of the scallop are moving together very quickly during the closing phase, the viscosity within the shell, because we're using a sheer thickening fluid in this case, is very large, whereas the viscosity in front of the head of the scallop is relatively low. So we have a net forward propulsion. Now on the opening phase, which is slow, we have relatively low viscosity on both sides. So high, high shear rates or high speeds result in higher viscosities. And you can see that during the rapid closing phase, the scallop moves forward, and then during the slow opening phase, it moves backwards again. But because of the shear thickening properties, it moves forward more during that forward stroke than it moves back during the back stroke. So the net result is that over many cycles, the scallop moves forward. This is great news because we can now use really simple actuation schemes, the sort of schemes for which there are many actuators available, like expansion and contraction, opening and closing, to build swimming micro-robots that can move through tissue and biomedically relevant fluids.
So, this is the summary of today's lecture. I talked about how surrounding medium affects the functioning of the biological system. We looked at how to distinguish between the thin fluid and thick fluid based on critical viscous force and Reynolds number. We looked at the life of microorganisms at low Reynolds number and we found that a low Reynolds number swimmer cannot swim by executing a geometrically reciprocal, reciprocal motion in a Newtonian fluid like water. And we looked at the swimming of the microorganisms, how they can swim by avoiding this problem. And then we also looked at the swimming by using the reciprocal motion in a non neutron fluid by artificial swimmers. Okay. Thank you very much. I will stop here.